Um, so yeah, as as Jackson said and, and Eddie earlier, please like feel free to feel free to interrupt with any questions. Like unmute yourself and ask, or pop them in the chat. If you have comments or you want to share your own experiences, that would be awesome. Um, the thing I wanted to talk about today for for fifteen or twenty minutes is um, behavioral data. So for for anyone that doesn't know about Snowplow, like we're we're a SaaS company, we uh, we generate enhanced and model uh, behavioral data for our customers. So collect it from web and mobile applications and put it into your warehouse um, event level data into BigQuery, Snowflake, event streams, data lakes, and all of that to do you know advanced analytics and AI on it. Um, and through having done that for the last ten years or so at Snowplow, we wanna we wanted to share some of our learnings about how to get value from behavioral data in the best ways. Um, so that's why I wanted to go through for 15 minutes. Um, so yeah, as I go through, please feel free to interrupt with questions, comments, or anything at all. Um, so yeah, I, uh, at Snowplow, I started off uh, working with our customers kind of in our professional services team, but I've recently moved over into the product team. Um, so I'll bring kind of both perspectives to, to this talk. Um, Cool. So starting off with behavioral data. So what I've talked to companies about behavioral data a lot, and, and often there's not a clear delineation in businesses about what actually behavioral data is or what its value is. And so just to start off with an example, um, like most companies use demographic data in some way, often to enrich other data sets. So demographic data is really important because um, it, it gives you information about who the who your user is, like if on your digital properties. Um, but it's 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 quite limited to those person level attributes. So you can get really, you know, you've got two very different users, like Prince Charles Ozzy Osbourne. Demographic data actually says they're very, very similar, but they're, you know, their intent and their actions would say a very, very different thing. Um, then there's transactional data. So this is kind of what you're, you know, what's recorded in your systems or in your CRM. And that gives you some visibility of the decisions that the individuals make over time. So Take an e-commerce example that you know that someone bought boots at some point, you know that someone maybe returned those boots at some, some later point. But behavioral data is, is the data set that really joins together, um, that really joins together that user journey and gives you this really detailed understanding of the intent behind everyone's actions. Um, and so behavioral data is extremely explanatory and actually very predictive. Um, and so it's this very rich, very granular data set. Um, and often, like, you know, it's been talked about in the past as clickstream data and, and, and web analytics data and so on, but actually behavioral data is a much broader thing with, with, with very broad applications um, when you frame it in that way. Um, and so when you do frame it in, the, in that way, you can see the businesses across the world actually get a lot of value from it. So um, taking Netflix as an example, I think actually that 171 is like two weeks out of date. It's like 180 now. But they they've built their business on behavioral data. Um, they first of all, whenever you log into Netflix, it's a totally personalized experience. From you know what's on your carousel to what order the carousels are in to what thumbnail is shown for each show. Um, to all, like it's it's a fully curated experience, and, and your experience is completely different to, to anyone else's experience on Netflix because they figured out um, what is most valuable to you, and that's what they show you. Um, but not only that, like on the other side of it, they they have a granular understanding of, you know, when you engage with their content, are you, you know, are you are you watching all the way through? Are you pausing and dropping off? Are you speeding through? Um, which content is he engaging with most? Which, which actors do you like the most? And they're using that to inform future content, content creation. Um, and so a company like Netflix that's so big is actually building a huge part of their competitive advantage in their business on behavioral data. Um, and so how do like a lot of companies want to kind of kind of match that? Oh, someone. Oh, if other brands wanted to replicate this, um, how would they how would they do that? How would they get started? And so what I want to take now is an example of a very, very simple business and talk about how that kind of business could get started with behavior data. Because it's a really daunting thing, looking at someone like Netflix and saying, oh, I, I want to personalize the full user experience. I want to give everyone in the business this full insight into which customer is about to churn and you know exactly how effective our marketing attributions, our marketing spend is. And that's really, really daunting. And you know, companies tend to jump to things like real time and machine learning as the, as the you know, sexy topics. But um, I want to talk through how we've seen companies successfully drive uh, value consistently with behavioral data. So taking this example of a sock shop. Um, so it's, it's a really useful thing to start off 
uh, right at the beginning with like, let's try and understand what customers are actually doing in our site. So how many, how many socks did we sell yesterday? That might be this question you start off by, by answering with behavioral data. Um, <clears throat> and then let's say you've got, you know, quite a varied catalog of socks and you want to know, um, do people like, you know, we've got socks with cars on them, socks with trucks on them, socks with bananas and socks with apples. Do actually people buy apple socks and banana socks together quite frequently? And so is there like theme preferences amongst sock buyers? Um, and then when uh, when people are flicking through the sock carousel of like the banana themed socks, are they are they actually zooming in on the banana image to get a better look at it? Or is any carousel interaction actually predictive of buying socks? So can we tie this specific behavioral interaction on our digital property with the, the outcome of the, the user journey or the, the user experience? Um, and then that maybe would set you up for quite a simple batch based uh, batch and rule based product pairing engine. So we know that themes like socks with the similar theme are often bought together. And so every week we can just, you know, group together all or give, you know, socks with a similar theme, a high similarity score, and we can we can uh, pair them together at checkout. Or when you open a PDP, you could show both the socks together, both pairs of socks, not both socks in a pair. Um, and then what that could eventually lead to, once you learn from that batch-based uh, product pairing engine, is you could move on to then predictive, like AI-powered and more real-time in-session sock recommendation engines. And so what, what this company uh, would have done in this case is they'd have started off with a really simple question, um, understanding, deeply understanding user behavior on their, on their digital properties, and then evolving the sophistication of that understanding over time and doing more and more high value things with that behavioral data. So moving from a historic understanding to having a hypothesis, carousel interaction is predictive of buying socks, to then driving value with that consistently in, in, in an automated fashion. So a, a recommendation engine. And so a second example, mm, we've been running campaigns. Um, we're big on digital marketing. So we've been running sock campaigns. So did our, did our campaign for fruit themed socks drive any traffic to the site? So you know, UTM parameter from this campaign, did it result in page views on our homepage or landing page or whatever? Simple question. Um, but then did our campaign for fruit theme socks drive any purchases? So now we're starting to talk about marketing attribution um, or like the simplest form marketing attribution. So, you know, can we tie together, you know, whether it was an awareness campaign or, you know, uh, a top of a uh, bottom of funnel campaign, did it drive purchases? But then we can maybe weave an in intent into that. So did our campaign for fruit themed socks drive purchases of fruit themed socks? Or did our campaign for fruit themed socks drive purchases of boots? Um, and so maybe, you know, maybe the intent there is misaligned and we're not treating the campaign in the right way in our attribution model. Um, so, so starting to evolve the sophistication of the, of the attribution model as well. Um, and then this is getting onto like multi-touch uh, and concurrent attribution models. So did a combination of campaigns over years drive a high lifetime value user to our site and encourage repeat purchases from them. Um, and then, yeah, obviously, then you've got concurrent multi-touch custom attribution. And so the second thing that a company should do, alongside starting off by building a deep understanding and evolving sophistication of that, moving from historic understanding to a predictive understanding, actually that is actually to start answering more questions and doing more projects with the behavioral data. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these because some of them are actually silly examples. Like, not many sock companies care about fraud, but let's say they did. Um, and so you can start off by just manually observing patterns. Lots of people buying lots of socks or committing some kind of sock fraud. Um, don't know what that would look like. But then you can start looking at, oh, if they're completing the checkout form really quickly, that's probably fraudulent. Again, not very realistic. But then, um, yeah, and then so, you know, based on some understanding of customer journeys, you can manually intervene um, using some rule set in, in checkout flows. Um, or if you're giving, you know, incentives to buy socks and people are abusing that. Um, and then, you know, you could, you could start going to more sophisticated things. Like when people are checking out, you expect humans to hover on a form before filling it in. You'd expect a computer to just like automatically tab through a form. And so actually hovering on a field is an anti-signal of, of fraud. Um, and then, so you could eventually move to, you know, real time fraud prevention algorithm. Um, and search, well, we're only talking about e-com right now, but I think search is heavily underutilized, search behavioral data in, in e-com. So, you know, uh, what, what percentage of clicks are, are for products in the top three results? Like when you go on Google, you expect, you don't expect to go to page two, but on a lot of e-com sites, you end up on page three, four, five, and six. So, um, 
you know, and even just talking about the top three results are at least 85% of clicks on those top three, top three results. Um, but then looking at the filters, so like a lot of e-com sites are effectively search experiences. Um, so are people using certain filters more likely to convert? So it's, it's almost like product touch point attribution. Um, and so should we be promoting certain filters or, you know, putting some pre pre settings, I think it's called on some filters uh, to encourage conversion. Um, and then, yeah, obviously suggested search and, and personalization there. Um, I'm not going to go through a second example for B2B SaaS. This is more just for the slides if you want to have a look later on. But the point I want to make with this is I've just gone through an e comm example. But the point I'm trying to make is that there's two ways to consistently drive value with behavioral data. One is to move from a historic understanding to predictive and like build a better understanding of your users, build hypotheses, and then predict. Um, and the second is to do that across more areas of the business. A lot of businesses silo behavioral data to just marketing or just product, but actually it's teams across the business to get value from it. Um, and so this journey that going, like going on this journey, starting from the top left, where you're starting off with actually really simple questions, like how many socks did we sell yesterday? To the right, the bottom right, where you've actually done all these four, these four major areas of driving value with behavioral data in really sophisticated ways and often in low latency ways. Um, it's it's extremely rewarding because the further right you move, you get disproportionately more returns, but it's really, really hard. Um, and so the key that we found is uh, adapting the organization to that change um, as, as, you, as you go through that journey. And so it's, the key is to think about it through a people process and tooling lens. And so um, just to make the point clear, um, an organization that's done, that's answered these four questions, like how many socks did we sell? Did our campaign prefer theme soft drive pur purchases? And, you know, we've noticed that there's like six orders a month that are more a quarter that are highly fraudulent. Um, that business looks very, very different to this business that's doing all of these things in production and, you know, has business criticality tied to them. Um, and so there's very different, there are very, very different pressures on the business at both those stages in that journey. Um, and so if you just, if you just keep these kind of, these two, data maturities, let's say, in mind as we go through the next, next three slides, um, it will be helpful. So this company at uh, point A in the journey, not very data mature, kind of getting started with behavior data, probably using uh, like a package analytics tool. And then you think of a company at B that's doing a lot of custom stuff in production. Um, and so starting off with people, I'm actually going to, I'm going to go through these quite quickly, but I'm, I'm very keen to take questions on, on any of them later. Um, or, or even after this, after this meetup, if, if anyone's interested. Um, and so the first one would be kind of on, on the org structure side. So there's a lot of hype around data mesh at the minute, I think well justified hype actually. Um, and so this is about like, so data mesh talks about the, the org structures that should be in place at you know, the highly sophisticated end of the spectrum, like enterprises who are highly sophisticated. Um, and so, you know, uh, it, it talks about decentralizing your data capability heavily and, and having data project managers, product managers across the business. And that's not always that way. That's going to be zero useful at the start of your data journey. So it's about evolving, um, evolving your, your org structures with, with your sophistication. And there's actually a really good webinar here that the head of data science at Huddle did. And, and she talks about how she scaled the data function there from three to 20. Um, and super valuable if that's a challenge that you're grappling with right now. And um, the second is culture. So um, this is about like with behavioral data, literacy is really, really important because typically behavioral data is the least well understood data set in a business. Demographic data is quite self-explanatory and transactional data is typically quite well understood. The schema for those things is well understood. People are familiar with the CRM tool that the data has probably come from in many cases. In many cases, not. But behavioral data is typically really hard to understand. It's often not very self-descriptive. It's often the largest data set by some margin and the hardest to wrangle and, and make sense of. And so literacy is really, really important. And something I've seen uh, companies do is kind of build up a squad of generalists. This is when you know you start moving to the not from point A to point B, because at point A, you tend to have you know data generalists doing everything anyway and delivering marketing attribution to business. At point B, you've got the business trying to self-serve on sophisticated things with data. And so there, if you've got generalists going around the business, helping um, you know, data consumer teams to actually drive value with data. So they go up to marketing, help them with a marketing attribution model. Then they go to the product team and help with an embedded you know, analytics portal or something. Um, that's really powerful because that builds literacy across those teams. And th those generalists, 
can be incentivized on literacy rather than on you know the ROI of the of the data project they're working on. Um, so that's I think that's a you know that that that's something that I've seen work really really well. Um, and in this direction, the, the weird thing with behavioral data is that the people producing behavioral data and the people consuming behavioral data are often different, which is really awkward because that means that the incentives are misaligned. With transactional data, a data engineer wants to build a model, let's say they'll build the ETL pipeline or they'll set up you know, the thing in five trying to stitch, pull the data out, they'll use it. And so they're incentivized to do it well. With behavioral data, you've got product teams generating the data or front end developers specifically generating the data almost as like a side, you know, it's part of their job, but not a core part of it. They're, it's a ticket they have to get out the way to get back to building interesting features. And they're never the people using the data. People using the data are the data team and data consumers. Sometimes they're the same. It's like the web analytics kind of field, but often it's, it's web uh, front end engineers setting up tracking and data teams using it. Um, and so something we've got at Snowplow is that our front-end engineers are actually empowered to use the data themselves, and they go into BigQuery and are able to look up how the feature they've built is performing straight after it's been implemented. And so they're incentivized just because of that to put tracking in before any feature ships. And so that, like, that kind of incentive structure works really, really well. So if you can see the outcome of, of all your work, all the features you're building, it, it incentivizes front-end teams to, to put in tracking before they ship. Um, then there's the process side of things. So I've already talked about this in quite some length, uh, quite some length with, uh, with the examples I shared earlier, but I just want to like repeat the point that the, the, like such a common failure mode with behavioral data is jumping to the most sophisticated thing really, really quickly. So just, you know, we don't have a good understanding of the customer journey. We don't have hypotheses to test, but we're going to build like a fancy, uh, you know, recommendation engine. Um, it you really have to you have, really have to step through step through the motions there, um, and so yeah, also jumping to real time like oh we need the data faster. So well, probably no you don't. And um, you can start off with the data slow, and then if there's a tangible need, then then we can do faster data. Um, quality is an interesting one because I think quality is one of those ones that's important at both point A and point B. What I was talking about earlier at the start of your journey is important, and at the end of your journey or towards. Uh, the end of your journey is really important. And the reason here, I think, is like, it's an interesting way to think about data is um, what, like, what more would need to happen to the behavioral data that you've got already in your warehouse for it to be classed as an asset on, on the balance sheet for your company? Um, in, in all likelihood, there's not actually that much more that needs to happen for that, for it to qualify as an asset. In many ways, it is an asset. It's this thing that you build up over time that drives increasing dividends um, over time as well. And so with that in mind, you can't generate behavioral data after the fact. And so it actually does make sense from early on to think hard about data quality, not moving from 99% you know, to 99.5%, but moving from 80% data quality to 99% or 95% data quality. I think those are important things to do right from, right from the get-go. Um, and then this last one I just kind of put in for completeness this is probably like six talks in and of itself, but like all the topics around lineage, um, and uh, and privacy and so on, like the, the, the yeah, all, all this, uh, all, all, all the governance related topics. I'm not going to go into it now because we wouldn't do it justice. Um, but like focusing maybe specifically on privacy, um, as behavioral data gets more widely used in the business, teams have to be far more careful about how PII is socialized. And so the biggest gap that, that I've noticed is that um, companies don't companies don't capture the basis for tracking. Uh, at the event level, which seems like a missed opportunity to me. Like, if you could know as a as a data team what was the basis for capture with every row of data that that you have got, behavioral data that you have got, it should make it much easier at any point down the line to know which data can be socialized to which team. Um, and so this this feels like a this feels like something that the most companies can enact um, fairly uh, fairly soon that would that would help in the long run. Um, and then the last point I'd make is around uh, throttling. So this is, so we've covered people in this process and now finally we're on tooling. When we use this framing of like driving consistent value of behavioral data over time, um, when we move from project A to B to C to D, these are actually quite different questions that we're trying to answer. And often packaged tools or, or point solutions are specialized in any one. And then they can also do, um, they can also answer other questions, but you know, it, it becomes prohibitive, like the engineering cost becomes prohibitive to actually productionizing those things. So for example, if you've got a uh, package, like a marketing analytics or like 
uh, let's say GA to do attribution. You can get some way with attribution. You can't, you can't do the really sophisticated attribution, but then the thing that becomes quite difficult is building uh, recommendation engines off the back of it. It's possible. It's just the engineering cost becomes quite large uh, to, building, um, to building recommendation engines by reading behavioral intent from, from customer journeys. And so what ends up happening is like by executing a more and more project, well, either a company doesn't execute a more and more projects and doesn't realize the value of behavioral data, or they build silos by, uh, for each project they undertake, they have a different tool to do that thing and, and aren't able to get through all the way to the right on in terms of sophistication. So the call to action here is to actually build in composability into, into your stack. And so this is why the modern data stack has kind of risen to, to prominence is that you've got, you've got um, composability there. You can, uh, you can swap out tools in the stack as you evolve sophistication. As you have more and more use cases, you can add you know, an AI element to it, like one of the data science studios, like Data IQ, Data Robot or something. Um, you can move from a batch to a batch and streaming um, system where you know, you're still doing all the analysis in batch, but you're informing predictive model or informing real-time models that are triggered off of off of the off of the Kafka topic or something, and so this is where kind of Snowplow sits is is on the is on the behavior data ingestion piece of this, um, and so for anyone that doesn't know, Snowplow is a behavior data platform. We we specialize in generating, enhancing, and modeling behavioral data, and so it's really creating the behavioral data that we've talked about already in a kind of AI and BI ready manner to use in all these different in all these different places to drive value and you know with advanced analytics and AI. It's not something for people at really point A in the journey because you know that's when package tools are really really good. It's for people that have want to execute on lots of data projects in a sophisticated manner. The, the Snowplow becomes the right thing to plug in to the to the modern data stack there. And so, if there's one thing to kind of leave you all on, it's that in the example I gave you with the socks, we haven't even scratched the surface in terms of the things that you can do with behavioral data. We've got like a list somewhere of like forty different rows that you can have um, with all the things you can do with behavioral data. Most of the companies I talk to are doing maybe four or five at best. Like there's some that go beyond 20 and it's the real pioneers that go up to 30 and so on. Um, so I think it's, if there's one thing you take away from this, it's, uh, it's, to, it's to reevaluate how much you're doing with behavioral data. Is there more value you could be driving and, and how could you start doing that by getting a deep understanding and testing hypotheses and and then moving to productionize those models. So, you know, things like churn propensity in this e-com example, um, better, better retargeting, better demand prediction, matching warehouse supplies with, with demand and predicting that demand as well. Cool. So two, two things to end on. We're like, as I said, I think the world is still really early with behavioral data. There's so much opportunity that hasn't, hasn't been realized yet, which is I think just so exciting. There's so many new interesting use, use cases that come out every day from new you know, business models, new companies, and all of that. And that as companies start to realize more and more of that value with behavioral data, it's so important that the, that the organization evolves with uh, along that journey to match the, 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 the amount of behavioral data is being used in the business. Um, yeah, I think that's that. So I'm happy to, happy to take any questions if there are any. Otherwise, I'll stop sharing and hand over to Emily. Okay, any questions before I begin for our guests? Feel free to drop any questions in the chat, guys, as they come up. Oh, can you see that, everyone? All right, so just a little introduction from me first before we go into the presentation. Um, so if you think about what Archit just presented and getting to the point where you've built a recommendations engine for SOX, what we really want to do uh, is to better support the Snowplow community to share expertise and collaborate on actually getting there. A, so that it's quicker and easier for you to deliver more value from your behavioral data. Um, and B, because we think that being able to collaborate and learn from each other is at the heart of a community and also uh, drives innovation. 
And so what we're sharing in this next presentation is essentially like a bit of a framework that we want to put in place that we think will help support uh, that sort of collaboration and sharing of expertise. And actually, as you can probably tell already, um, I'm cheating a bit here, uh, but there's no two better people to talk through this than our VP of engineering, uh, Steve Coffin-Smith, and our head of engineering, Paul Bucock. And so I'm actually gonna play a recording of them from the London meetup in February. Um, as always, pop questions that come up in the chat um, and we'll have a Q&A at the end. Um, actually, do you know what I forgot to do is share my audio. So let me share again. And just, just a note before the video starts, Steve had some Wi-Fi problems when he made this presentation. So at the start, it's a little bit, uh, the sound cuts in and out. It's not Emily's Wi-Fi, it's Steve's on the original recording. Okay. So the Snowplow community is really important to Snowplow and important to it. It's been important from day one. Um, and an awful lot of what Snowplow, the company does, uh, is behind trying to improve the platform that we give to the community and, and better enable um, as many people uh, in, in the world as possible to, to have um, you know, solid behavioral data strategies and happy data teams. I just asked the question, like, what, what, does, what does Snowplow really do? And I think what we, at the crux of what we do is to, to, um, to, to give data teams the, the, the tools that they need to to answer um, complex questions or to to Alex's point, um, do really sophisticated use cases around AI, AI and and kind of reactive um, reactive processes based on behavioral data and and for that to be true, they they for that to be possible, they they need something like Snowplow empowering it. So so the community is a great avenue for us to try and. Um, you know, spread that message and 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 spread that value. So for, for anyone who's not not um, aware of who I am, my name is Steve. I'm VP Engineering at Snowplow. I've been with Snowplow for a few years, and I actually joined with a long history of, uh, which I just shared with the breakout room, not in data, but of pissing off data teams by giving them crap data and asking impossible questions. So I was very well qualified to come in and start solving that problem, and very galvanised around solving that problem for as many people as possible. But there's certainly been some challenges with the way that we set up the Snowplow community, and challenges that we've been working a lot over the last last year to overcome and um, and that we, we want to bring a new plan in for 2022 in terms of how we can better enable and, and, and further grow the, the snowplow community. Um, I was going to ask for the next slide then, <laughs> I forgot I was sharing. Um, so to kick off with, with um, you know, I, I, I came in to try and make a difference to today's to teams world over and I want to take a moment just to remind you of everything for anyone who's in the community already for what we've achieved so far. So we have the third highest adopted tracker globally, um, 9,600 GitHub stars across our orgs and um, 5,500 discourse um, visits. That was in January, but January, I think it was actually a little bit lower. I probably could have gone further back and got some higher numbers, but um, they're all indicative of a very active community. A lot of people are out there using Snowplow technology and we are making a difference to the data teams world over. Um, so I think it's worth just pausing on that, even though we, we have room to grow and we have more things we can do, we're already um, making a big difference. And we're really here to, as I said, make you know, make data teams happy and give them the tools that they need to be the heroes in their organization to be able to feed into the best decision making processes or build solutions that are out there making customer experiences far better and driving the value in the business. So um, it's really important that we do that. And we do that. We believe that we do that through providing them with high quality behavioral data. Um, we want them to focus on the way that they, they solve those problems for their business rather than necessarily um, you know, focusing too much on the technology itself. That's why with open source, we can give people a great um, leg up to be able to take those, those components, take those strategies and start having an impact in their business as early as possible. Um, that's the ambition, but the reality over the last period is that we've set a very high bar to get started with Snowplow, just to feel Snowplow for the first time. You may have needed um, some prerequisite infrastructure knowledge, you need a lot of time available to you to go through our power docs to find out how to set up your first Snowplow pipeline. Um, and a lot of people were, reply, were relying on the docs, which I'll be honest, though we've got room for improvement in the docs. There's definitely some treatment that's going to happen there over the next um, over the next year or two. To we really want to be in a position where we have industry leading docs, um, and we have very active forums, which is good. So if, if something's not covered there, then then there is a place to get an answer to your question. But um, it's not really the streamlined experience that we want for people getting involved in the in the snowplow community. Um, so we've been working on that journey, and what, one of the things that we've done over the last um, year 
is to put together something that we call Tri Snowplow. So Tri Snowplow is um, it's it's now actually a hosted service. It used to be that you provide your own sub account and we would deploy it into the sub account for people, but now it's all fully hosted our side. It takes about five minutes to stand up your first Snowplow pipeline and you need no infrastructure knowledge in order to be able to do that. Um, it's slightly restricted. It doesn't do a lot of things that a full Snowplow pipeline would do, but it just, it lands that first Snowplow data that you've collected from your solution, whatever it is, um, into a Postgres database. So you can start to see the difference between the data that you're working with today to the data that you could be working with if you had a Snowplow pipeline powering your, your behavioral data strategy. So it, we've we've seen a lot of uptake of it um, and we have seen people join the community as a result of it. I can see actually Joe's on the call and I think Joe, you started with Try Snowplow um, and now you know, Joe, Joe is um, super supportive in the forums for us as well. So it's, it's great to see it as an on-ramp into the open source community. Um, it's time limited at the moment because it costs us money to run, um, but we are looking at ways to be able to uh, extend the try experience to help people to, to stay with it a little bit longer. So that'll be something to watch out for this year. Um, another solution that we have people who really want to stand up a full snowplow pipeline but don't want to spend two weeks going through our power docs um, is a quick start installation guide. So I've, I've snapshotted the one on AWS. We have one for GCP as well. So for this, you need roughly an hour um, to stand it up and, and enough infrastructure confidence to, to press a button on the automations that we give people. And essentially, it's a set of automations that we have for setting up a, a vanilla um, snowplow pipeline. Um, but it has all of the features in there. Um, you, you can have custom schemas, you can um, customize the enrichments, um, you can load to Postgres, but I think, I can't remember if, if we've released it yet, but there will be options to, to load into other destinations um, in the near term as well. So. Um, plenty of opportunity there to start serving your first use cases. There are still some problems with or, or challenges to overcome with Quick Start. It's not highly scalable. It won't be highly resilient unless you do a lot of other things to make to get it there. Um, but it is ready there to serve your first no power um, use case. So we've been able to take it over the last year from uh, a process that would have needed a lot of prerequisite infrastructure knowledge and a couple of weeks of a very determined um, set of people who would be able to go through our power docs, we brought it all the way down to an hour to stand up your first open source um, snowplow pipeline and start experiencing the difference between a snowplow behavioral data strategy um, and anything that was there before. Um, so yeah, we, we've, we've effectively lowered the bar to join the Snowplow community. I'm really excited by that. I think it's going to have a big impact. But as I was just saying to the breakout session, the next challenge we have is, is still the why. Like we're still asking for someone to invest some time in this. And to get, to get the why going, we really want to hear from people in the community about the problems that they're solving with Snowplow. We know that there's some really interesting um, use cases, really interesting challenges that can be overcome using high quality behavioral data but the big shame is that our community may be, um, we, we believe it's at least thousands large. It could even be tens of thousands large. Um, we know very little about the problems that the, and the success of the problems that the open source community are overcoming and the successes they're having. And if we can find a way to surface those, and I know that Eddie and Jackson are, are looking at ways that we can, we can, um, we can do this to get more, more stories out there about how to use um, Snowplow effectively within your organization. If we can do that paired with a low bar to entry, we really hope that we can drive um, the community growth this year. And there's a lot of reasons to drive the community growth. Um, we, we really lean on the community. What we're building here at Snowplow, for anyone who's not aware, is a very highly configurable thing. It can do lots of things for lots of different people. Um, it's great to see in the community when someone hits a use case and they say, hey, we're tracking these types of events at these velocity and from these places and we've hit a problem. We learn so much from the community's adoption of the pipeline and it helps us to make it better for everybody. I always say like it's it, the, one of the advantages of the open source community is that, that one person hits a problem first, it gets fixed, we solve it for everybody and it, it really strengthens the platform, which is a good reason to, to um, to to provide things out to the open source community uh, another another reason is it's not just kind of finding bugs but it's also setting a direction for us and this is something that you know as as, as an employee of snowplow we don't we don't hear a lot of his kind of comment on our strategic direction why are you making that decision why do you want to go this way have you ever thought of doing that we would love to have more of those conversations with the community outside of this thing broke in this scenario and and um ideally it would do this other thing and we'd love to start a few more of those um conversations with people and, and be more informed by the community because we really trust your judgment as, as a large number of people who are um, really trying to stretch our technology. Um, and we have a potential to build more of this system together. And this is where we hit another blocker. 
So, so the first block of being the time to get started in the community, the second block of being understanding the why to get to the point where you can commit that time. And the third thing is like, where, where can you push the platform forward? And that's something that we've been working on and something I'll hand over um, to Paul to talk to. Hello. Um, so thank you very much, Steve, for the introduction. Um, so I'm Paul, I'm head of engineering. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna introduce really um, something we're calling integrations. This is, um, some of it's new, some of it's old, but rethought um, that I'm gonna talk about today. And um, yeah, some of it doesn't exist yet. Some of it will exist soon, some of it already exists. Um, so yeah, bear with me, but I'm, I'm trying to like, open, I guess, discussion on, on some of these topics and, and maybe a little bit of um, yeah, thought provoking stuff for us to maybe discuss a little bit later in the, in the session. Um, so we'll move on, Steve. So I'm gonna start with Igloo and the thing that Alex mentioned earlier. Um, Igloo, um, just to recap, is the, the machine readable open source um, schema registry for JSON schemas. These are This defines the shape of all of the data that you people typically um, track into a Snowplow pipeline. Um, and currently, really the top two of these, these two big boxes um, are where most people um, have or store their, their Igloo schemas. Um, so there's Igloo Central, the Snowplow managed and maintained Igloo repository. This is a great place for those core um, schemas that are vital for your Snowplow pipeline to run as you would expect. Um, and then there's the private Igloo servers, the servers that most pipelines will have their own private Igloo server for the, the schemas that are really specific to your organization that allow you to do the really really specific things to solve the, for the business logic that you've got in your, your org. Um, now, one of the things we would like to sort of promote is sometimes some of these like private ig private igloo schemas, they might be useful for that wider community. But there's not a great place currently to get them out and share them with the world. Um, by You could technically submit them to Igloo Central. However, Igloo Central is like a, I call it a dangerous place for lack of a better word. We have to tread very carefully with the schemas that are in Igloo Central. Um, an issue with a schema that launched on Igloo Central has the potential to cripple pipelines. So we are very, um, very careful um, with what we released to Igloo Central, very thoughtful. Um, so we need to be very comfortable with the testing um, and with the rollout of all of those schemas. For community authored schemas, um, it's hard for us to have the confidence that we will be able to effectively maintain that schema going forwards. So what we're looking at introducing um, is a community destination um, to publish your schemes. These likely won't be hosted, um, so they won't have that same danger that Igloo Central has, and, but there'll be a place for you to browse and go to to find community-authored schemas with a description and an understanding of its purpose for you to download and put onto your own private Igloo server. Think of it like a marketplace for schemas. Um, and then maybe that spawns other Igloo repositories. Maybe people will host community additions um, schemas. They're pretty, simple to host in reality, um, but that's maybe just a, uh, a wish um, for what the future might hold. All right, we'll move on. The other play, um, the second thing of the three that I'm gonna talk about today is our move towards destinations. Um, so we realized that um, the Snowplow has got this huge value in the data coming in, landing in the warehouse, and then people activating that data in the warehouse, or activating that data directly off the stream, um, the real-time streams that Snowplow gives you access to. Um, but there was definitely a, a number of like organizations that wanted to get that data into other places, not just the warehouse. Um, one thing that emerged over the probably the last 12 months, really, um, is something called reverse ETL. And this technology partners really well with, with Snowplow, and I thought was worth a mention. Um, there's providers like Census and HighTouch that are, are doing great stuff over in that space. And that's good for taking the aggregated data in the warehouse and shifting it off to other systems like Salesforce. And what it's maybe not so good at is thinking about these things um, in real time. So that forwarding of that event level data, of that user behavior. So when a certain, when the user does a very particular thing on a particular tool, triggering some sort of downstream um, behavior of that easily. So also, as we had this sort of realization, Google announced um, Google Tag Manager server-side, 
And it felt like a really good early complementary technology for us to leverage to try the waters here, to see what was going on um, in this space. Um, and it also, it's, a, it's something that you deploy yourself. So it matches that like first party ecosystem that we promote so heavily with Snowplow. Google were giving us the same tooling here to allow you to do something um, to accept event data and distribute that to multiple destinations. Um, now, what's interesting here is there's multiple um, sort of levels of, uh, for Google Tag Manager services in particular, they sort of like vendor or community author tags in their marketplace. And we've also started producing these Snowplow enhanced tags. These are tags that work really well with Snowplow data. Um, and that's where we really want, you know, we want more feedback. We want people to maybe try and use these, maybe even build your own um, tags that work really well with Snowplow events from the Snowplow trackers. And then lastly, we've got these native integrations. Um, the, the, and this is something I won't touch on too much today, um, but perhaps something to keep your eye out for the future uh, in the next 12 months, um, is the idea of relaying this data um, directly into other platforms. Um, Indicative already exists and has for a long time as a relay, um, but new ones such as Kafka, um, other event stream technologies, um, and maybe even relaying them into Google server side um, as well, which we'll touch on in a slide or two. Move forward. Told you it'd be slick. Right, um, the, so this is what it looks like, just to give you a really quick insight into um, the server-side tag manager from Google. So you have your tracker on your website like you probably used to, but instead of sending it directly to your Snowplow pipeline, you send it into the Google Tag Manager server-side container. There's a Snowplow client that reads these events. Um, it builds this common object, and then this, this object, this client object in between, can then be sent to multiple destinations. So you can continue forwarding it to your Snowplow pipeline, there's a number of Snowplow author tags that work really well with any data collected by a Snowplow client. But then there's this wider community um, of author tags as well, such so as sending a data into Google Analytics before, maybe Facebook ads, maybe TikTok ads. There's all sorts of different um, vendor and community author tags that are available already. And it's still quite a young piece of technology. So we're, we're excited to be part of this sort of community as well, uh, integrating with other tools like, like Google Tag Manager server side. Um, if you move forward on more slide. Um, so we see it in two ways. The thing I've just discussed is sort of what's grayed out at the bottom, um, where you're doing Snowplow into GTM server side and then onto other destinations. However, we think there's a really interesting use case here where you first track directly into your Snowplow pipeline, but then by leveraging the real-time capabilities, you then relay that enriched, validated data from Snowplow into Google Tag Manager server side. Um, and then you take just that rich data that's already gone into your warehouse, you play that then into your third party tools that you want to um, send the data into. Now, the thing you might be thinking here is there's a missing piece of technology. Steve clicks the mouse, I'll show you where it is. It's right there. Um, and that is this little link between the back of your Snowplow pipeline and sending that data into Google Tag Manager server side. So over the next um, period of time, we've well, we've already started building it. Um, there's a new piece of technology on the horizon for us um, that's going to help everybody do this. It's already part of the paired product um, of Snowplow. We're currently working on um, how we can reshape that and, and provide it to the open source community. Um, so that's something that's, that we're looking into very deeply at the moment, and we're very optimistic we'll be able to provide um, in, the, in, the, in the future. Not only does that support this Google Tag Manager service side thing, but it'll also give you the capability of of other destinations as well, particularly ones that are well suited to Snowplow data. Like maybe you want your data in Azure or something, or uh, you want it in a Kafka cluster for the other parts of your organization, things like that as well, it's particularly well suited. Which then on the next slide allows you to do basically what I've just described, Snowplow pipeline, and then into the Google Tag Manager server side, um, and then using these other tools downstream, just as a one idea of what maybe you could do with this technology. All right, let's move on to the last thing I want to quickly talk about, and that is data modeling, and um, which is another opportunity to integrate with Snowplow data. So this data modeling, when we, we, we use this um, you know, in, in a few places, this term, and basically what we're talking about is taking that raw data that you collect, that, that granular user behavior, and it's coming from all of these different tools, and aggregating that up into these model tables that make it easier to perform analytics on the data um, that you've collected. So that's it in a nutshell. And what we've invested in quite heavily over the last 12 months is supporting DBT um, and partnering with DBT um, to, to, to make it easier, um, one, to use, um, to create 
to do this modeling, but also to give the opportunity for the community to maybe get a little bit more involved um, in this modeling effort as well. So if you move to the next slide, you'll see that there's um, a number of Snowplow author tags, uh, sorry, not tags, um, DBT models. So we've got Snowplow Web and Snowplow Mobile, those two are already out today. Um, currently in development is something called Snowplow Media, which is particularly focused on video tracking right now. Um, and then maybe in the not too distant future, you'll see Snowplow e-commerce as well. All of these built on DBT's um, platform, all available in the DBT hub um, for you to um, use. And if there'll be certain tracking that you need to do based on those igloo schemas that I discussed earlier, um, that'll drive um, your ability to just deploy these models in DBT and it'll aggregate that data up into something much more usable. And what we really want to um, start promoting and hearing more about the, what the community is doing is these models, particularly the web one and the mobile one, they're open to extension. There's extension points in here where you can plug in your own logic using your own custom schemas. So if we're publishing schemas into the community igloo space, the one that doesn't exist yet, but maybe will um, shortly, we could then have companion extensions to the, to the models. This is a future state that we'd love to start seeing happening. People talking about these things, releasing these things and sharing with one another. Um, and then maybe we even have like separate Snowplow use case community author packages based on these um, community schemas. And then it's likely we would love to start seeing um, in Igloo Central, there's going to be like vendor schemas too um, that are in there already um, and potentially will continue being in there through our partners um, and partnerships that we have. We may start seeing some Snowplow vendor authored packages as well for Snowplow collected data in these downstream um, platforms. That's about it from me. So I'm going to hand back to Steve, who's just going to give you a bit more of an idea around that community vendor Snowplow split. Yeah, thanks for that cool video. I'm really sorry about that. I've been on the wrong. I've been on the wrong Wi-Fi all day. You find out at six o'clock that you, that everyone's had poor um, poor feed from me all day. But um, I, I'm really excited by this this strategy that we have because I think it does two things. One is it helps the community to more quickly activate on Snowplow because they'll have um, a wider variety of, of kind of common use cases to pull from. But also it gives um, uh, an area of the estate that's much easier for people to contribute to. And, and, and I think those two marry up quite well because activation is such a broad area. Uh, there's so many things you can do with Snowplow and giving and by engaging the community on this and, and providing these areas where it's much easier for them to contribute um, means that we should get more of them. And I think the things that have made it difficult to contribute is 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 one, the area of the estate with uh, you know, the, the, the community has to be protective of the pipeline. It's really important that we we make sure that any any um, additions there don't compromise the the security or the performance or the ability to cost optimize or scale that that part of the operations so so it's a bit that we have to be really protective over but there's some areas of the estate where it is a lot easier to extend as pools covered integrations and schemas and modeling and just general data strategies to solve interesting problems so so i think that's a much easier place to contribute and we're looking forward to seeing more more come from there and i think one of the main blockers we have is actually a non-technical blocker though which is just we as, uh, as a community have not been very good as, at labeling things as like experimental but we've got something coming out soon in enrich that's very experimental it's probably not where it should be. It's not going to cause any harm to anyone who's not using it. But if anyone wants to come along for the ride, they can turn it on and get some um, interesting information out of Enrich. Um, but as soon as we're out of that stage and we decide actually that is worth pursuing, there's some interesting use cases that come off. We're going to want to refactor it and put it into an alpha service that will we'll invite the, the community to support us on and then push it into beta and then into the, the main Snowplow product, I think, you know, Snowplow community product. But the, the way that... Um, the way that it works now is any contribution is straight on to the to the main line of the application, uh, and that's that's quite a, a quite difficult place to accept contributions to. And the other the other thing is to be able to label those um, contributions to say you know this this uh, set of models is from the community or it's vendor supported or it's Snowplow supported. And I think the only difference in the second two is the extent to which people are being paid to invest in this stuff. Like a vendor has a very invested uh, will have people on their payroll uh, invested in making sure that 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 thing continues to work um, ongoing and as Snowplow are very invested in the in the product itself uh, and and the of it so and that's the only facets there but i think understanding where the integrate come from 
um, can can make it so that we're more liberal about what gets accepted into the ecosystem. So that's a non-technical change. It's just a matter of us putting some rules in place and finding out how we're going to articulate that back to the community. Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, there, there's some changes that are coming in the community for 22. I appreciate um, uh, some of you have been with the community for some time. I might recognize some of the challenges that we've um, that we're talking about here, here today and, and anyone who's new to the community um, will hopefully be uh, encouraged by the fact that it's a lot easier to get involved in the Snowplow community and to un understand what it is that we're trying to achieve together here um, today than it has been previously and we, we plan to to improve that a lot over 2022. Okay. Um, oh, excuse me. Well, I'm afraid. <laughs> One second. I'll just stop sharing. Um, yeah. So there's some really exciting stuff lined up for the future, as you can see. Actually, um, a lot of the building blocks which we outlined there are already in place. Um, and yeah, what we're hoping is that it'll create this sort of collaborative ecosystem, which I mentioned before, built around uh, getting the most value from your data. So say you want to deliver SOC fraud detection, um, just going back to what Chit's presentation. <laughs> so how did others in the community do it? Like, is there prior art that you can learn from? Imagine this sort of searchable space where you can view each other's schemas and tracking design, uh, discuss and test customize your data model or even share uh, SQL queries, or maybe even add a new destination that you want to get your fraud scores to. Um, so that's the thinking around this, and uh, I'm really excited about it. Um, but of course, um, we really want to know what you think too, um, how you see this sort of ecosystem being valuable to you, what you envisage it looking like. Um, I'll open up for questions in a bit, but I did want to mention two things just to start, um, just to finish off actually. Um, so the first one is that we kicked off an open source research panel a few months ago. Um, and I'll share my screen again. Is that good? Yep. Cool. And the idea is that when we're scoping like some of these solutions, similar to what we've just been uh, discussing uh, for open source uh, users and for the wider community, we'd reach out to you uh, on an ad hoc basis for um, feedback. Could be small stuff, uh, could be big ideas. Uh, we give you the option to take part or not, of course. And if you decide to, then there'd be uh, something in it for you too, um, maybe uh, a voucher or, or something like a t-shirt potentially um, for your time and expertise um, is really, really valuable to us. Um, and it also gives you the opportunity to shape the future of open source. So if you are interested in finding out more or you want to sign up, then uh, do reach out to me. Um, we'll send my details through uh, after this as well, but reach out to me, my email address is there. Uh, and we can provide you more details on that. Uh, there's a form that you can fill in to sign up, basically. Um, let's say, yeah, that's that. And then I'll hand over to Eddie uh, to talk through this one. Thanks, Emily. Uh, again, driving on from what Emily has just said, uh, we're really keen to get people involved in the community. And we're also very keen to recognize and reward those people who do put lots of effort into the community. We think it's only fair that when people answer questions on the forum and things like that, that they get some kind of recognition and reward. And on the basis of that, we're going to institute what we're calling at the moment, the Community Champions Programme. Um, like I say, it's to recognize those people who are regular contributors, be that answering questions on the forum, uh, perhaps regularly attending meetings, asking really useful and interesting questions, people who attend our conferences, also people who do contributions, whether they are uh, bug requests, issues, et cetera, on GitHub. We really want to um, recognize and reward uh, those types of activities. We're also looking to, like I say, uh, group these people into this kind of community champions program. Um, and what would you get out of that? Because we, we get a lot from it. We would obviously, like Emily was saying, we want to give back as well. 
Um, so if we're if you're invited into this community champions program, firstly you get a badge on this course. Um, but we're also going to do what we can to spotlight our champions. Uh, we have a new uh, community hub coming, um, and we will spotlight both partners and community champions in the spot on the hub. Um, we're also looking to uh, have an annual conference for developers and users of Snowplow, and the champions will obviously uh, get free entry to the conference. And we'll also basically treat you like uh, royalty. Uh, that doesn't mean we'll cut your head off. It means we'll take you out for dinner. Um, so we'll wine and dine our community champions. You'll also have access on a regular basis to the senior leadership team and also to the engineers and to the data teams, because we want this to be a relationship, a two-way relationship. So we help you uh, perhaps solve some of your problems. Uh, and you also, you feed your ideas into the product direction. Um, and as part of that, of uh, this uh, relationship get building, you'll have regular um, insights into how the Snowplow product roadmap is developing. And hopefully you'll be able to feed into the uh, development of the roadmap.